Well, we've reached the appointed hour, and uh, we're outnumbered, but not by much. <laughs> uh, but hopefully we'll have uh, some people tune in and, uh, and hear about this electronically. Um, it's uh, good to see those of you that are here are here, and um, we're happy to be here. This is our second meeting of the day. We were at CPI <coughs> earlier. And, had a few more, but not. Uh, it wasn't overcrowded, put it that way. I'm, of course, Paul Torkelson. Uh, won my eighth election to the Minnesota House recently, so returning. Uh, we, uh, as a Republican, uh, we had hoped uh, to be returning as a majority, but uh, that did not happen. Uh, we will be in the minority. And there's been a, a, a big change in our caucus. Uh, Kurt Dowd, who has been our leader for the last 10 years, will no longer be the leader. Uh, Lisa Damoth from Cold Spring, who is going into her third term in the House of Representatives, was elected as the minority leader, the leader of the Republican caucus. Um, after she was uh, elected by the caucus, uh, she turned around and asked me to be her deputy, so I will be the deputy leader of the House Republican Caucus. That's kind of like the number two person in the caucus. So uh, my responsibilities within the caucus will change pretty dramatically. I'll have a lot more work to do. I've already been doing a lot more work in, in relation to staffing and structuring how the caucus is gonna operate and selecting our leads on the committees and all that. So I've been spending quite a bit of time in, in St. Paul already getting ready for the situation, or for the session that's coming up in January. So looking forward to, to that new role, and uh, it'll be challenging. Um, the other big thing I think that uh, I would note is that we have a lot of new faces in the caucus. We have 24 new uh, freshmen in the caucus. That, uh, you know, it's their first term, they have a lot to learn. Um, and we are going to be mentoring them and trying to get them up to speed as quickly as possible. Uh, that's uh, out of the 64. That's you know all, all, over a third of the caucus is our new is new faces. Then you have to also remember that members that were first time last term were part of the COVID term, so um, they never had a live committee meeting. For instance, all their committee meetings were on Zoom. So I call them the red shirt freshmen. So we've, we've got a class of freshmen and we've got some, some members that still are really learning the ropes because they were in part of that COVID session. So lots of changes uh, at the Capitol, uh, but the number uh, in the House didn't change. We still have 70 uh, Democrats and 64 Republicans. It's exactly what we had last biennium. Now, the, where they come from has changed a bit. Uh, we won a number of elections in northern Minnesota. Uh, in fact, there were two recounts that we just were just determined this last week uh, that we won by some quite narrow margins, but they turned out that the results on election night were almost exactly as the same as the results of the, of the recount. So um, the, the, the mix of legislators has changed a bit, but the number of Republicans <coughs> versus Democrats is uh, going to be exactly the same. Uh, the one thing I know for sure, besides my role as, as a deputy minority leader, I will be the lead on the elections committee in the House, uh, and we will be dealing with uh, any changes to the election law laws in Minnesota, and uh, we'll see what, uh, what proposals come forward. Uh, um, not, nothing's really sure come forward yet, but uh, that'll be happening uh, soon when we get to, to session. So with that, I'll turn it over to my friend and colleague, Senator Gary Dames. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you folks for being here. Uh, I think now Paul and I have been doing, I think this will be our 13th year of doing these town hall meetings, and I always appreciate working with Paul on these. Uh, Paul's being a little modest. His job as deputy uh, majority or minority leader is certainly, uh, as, as a rural legislature, I'm glad to see that Paul's in that position. Uh, that position has a lot of, uh, there's a lot of strength and power in that position. And uh, he could, Paul has a lot of influence on the folks that uh, he'll be working with. So that's good for rural Minnesota because uh, typically rural Minnesota, we're kind of, uh, uh, 
we have to fight for what we get, and, and we will continue to do that. Uh, as Paul was alluding to some of the changes, uh, we've been in the majority for six years in the Senate, and we really expected to come back in the majority this trip around. Uh, we kind of figured, I was looking at a 35 to 32 margin, 35 Republican, 32 Democrat. Well, as it ended up, it's 34 to 33, and uh, we have 33, so we are in the minority. Uh, being in the minority changes things considerably. Uh, the majority will set the committees. They determine what committees they'll have and how they'll be laid out time-wise, things like that. They determine how many people will be on the committees. Uh, we did get our allotments for the various committees uh, about a week to 10 days after the uh, election, they left us know what their committee, what their committee breakup would be as far as which committees, you know, there'd be, there will be a standalone ag policy and finance committee, that'll be one committee. Sometimes they merge that with something else. Uh, they put energy and environment together, different things like that. They did show us their committee charts. There's about 20 committees. And then last, uh, I think it was about a week ago, maybe not quite, we actually got our, our slots, the number of people we'll have on each committee. And so now we're in the process of working through that. Unfortunately, when you go from the majority to the minority, you have to leave a lot of people go. Because in the majority, you have the committee chair positions, you have, uh, you're involved with the media more, so you have more media positions, uh, you have more research positions, and so we had to reduce our, our complement of employees considerably. Uh, we did get that done. I served as the chair of that committee. I've been on it now for, I think, 12 years. But we did get that, uh, that completed so that uh, the employees we had to let go would know early enough because there's a lot of jobs out there right now in a lot of different positions that are tied to the legislative system and so we wanted to make sure they had an opportunity to get some of those jobs. So uh, that's always a tough thing to do, but we did get it done. And, and so it's, we, we need to move on. We're in the minority, and we, we need to move on. And uh, uh, there are certain things that we can still do in the minority. When you have a vote of 34 to 33, it's really tough. We were in that for a couple years. We were in that 34, 33. And, uh, it's really hard to get a lot of things passed because you have such a slim margin. This currently, up until January, the end of January 2nd, we'll still be in the majority and we have a 36-31 margin. We had uh, 34 Republicans and then we had two Democrats that went independent and caucused with us and voted with us the last uh, two years. So we ended up, when it come to voter strength, we were like a 36 to 31. That five point margin really does make a difference. And so they, the, the DFL has started to talk some about what their priorities are, but uh, we expect to see a lot more on what their priorities are for this coming session. So the first big surprise was is that we ended up losing the majority, but I would say it was probably a bigger surprise to the DFL when they got the majority. They didn't expect that and, and we didn't expect to lose it, but that's how it turned out. But uh, so we're waiting to see what some of their priorities and stuff are as we go through the session and things like that. The other big surprise was when the November forecast came out in early December, I was more at that, I figured in that nine to 11 billion, I, I didn't think it would go up as much as it did, it's up to 17.8 billion. So what that means is that uh, we have a 17.8 billion dollar surplus. Part of that came from additional taxes that uh, were unexpected to be received in, in this time period, in the projected time period. Another piece of it came from currently our budget, our general fund budget's about 52 billion dollars. And that would, that would be for this biennium. It's gonna end up coming in, June 30th will be the last day of the biennium. And so it's gonna come in, estimated right now, about 50 billion. So it'll be about a $2 billion 
reduction in the amount of money spent in the last two years. So that would be then, of course, put into the surplus. So, uh, and then a lot of that surplus was still some one-time special money that came in due to COVID, some of the Make America Better and all these things. Uh, some of that money is still part from that. So that what's, that's what creates this $17.8 billion surplus. But this is, I believe, the eight, it's for sure the eighth and maybe the ninth year that we went into a surplus. So when you go into a surplus like this, and, and the last one we had was 13 billion, and now we're up to 17, almost 18 billion, it really tells me that we're overtaxing our constituents. And it's pretty hard to, to think that you're not when you see eight or nine years of consistent surpluses. If we had, say, a million or a billion dollar surplus or a billion dollar deficit, that's kind of the range you try to be in because, you know, a billion dollars is an awful lot of money, but when you start looking at a $50 billion, $52 billion budget, it's a couple percent, and you couldn't be off, you know, you can be off that with diff different changes and stuff. But when you start looking at the ones that we've got, and you can just, you know, you're, you're always in these higher end, uh, you know, three, four, five billion, and then up to, to 13, and now up to almost 18, uh, we had planned on taking a serious re look at reforming our tax structure to make this much more palatable for, for our constituents. During the campaign, uh, it was campaigned by both sides of the aisle, but the Democrats and Republicans, both of us campaigned to get rid of the tax on social, the income tax on social security. The uh, governor campaigned for that, the speaker of the house campaigned for that, the uh, the DFL House Senate, they campaigned for that. Now they're starting to retract a little on that and saying, well, if they make, you know, if they're, if they're considered wealthy, then we're not going to give that reduction. So we'll see how that plays out. It's going to be hard. Uh, I, I think we're going to be able to get some stuff done on some, on some tax reform and tax policy because it's going to be hard, pretty hard to sell to the public when you have these large surpluses that that we shouldn't be doing some type of a tax reform. There's other areas uh, that we had looked at that we felt we could do some tax reform. And, and part of that is on property tax, part of that is on the uh, uh, statewide business property tax, uh, part of its income tax, the social security tax. The social security tax seems to be the one that most people want to see acted on the, the, the one that they want acted on mostly. And so hopefully we can get together and get that done. Uh, uh, other things, uh, you know, we haven't seen their agenda yet as far as what they're gonna promote, what they wanna get done, and what the priorities will be as far as what'll be first. So I know that marijuana is getting a lot of, lot of discussion right now, just how far that'll get this year, I'm not sure. But it'll be interesting to see what comes in behind that as far as their priorities. So right now, we're kind of in that, that quiet spot right now legislatively because we, had, we kind of had our uh, agenda laid out as to what we planned on doing because we thought we'd be in the majority. I don't know how far they've gotten into their agenda, but I mean, they're always working on things that they want to get done whether you're in the minority or not. So I'm sure it won't be too far when we'll start seeing more on their agenda. We do go back in the session January 3rd, so uh, then these things will start to really ramp up and we'll start really seeing what's out there. But that's kind of just a, you know, kind of a summary of where things are at. And uh, uh, we have not uh, decided, we have not put a pencil to all of the positions as far as committee-wise. We're hoping to, uh, announce them publicly uh, by the end of this week, if not by the end of this week, certainly the beginning of next week, so that people know what their, what committees their senator and the, the, what committees they're gonna serve on. So with that said, uh, certainly open it up for questions. Um, yeah, the budget surplus is yes. the one I was really concerned about. Yeah. I mean, here, to bring it to the States bringing in all this money, and then for, they're taxing people, and then they want to turn around instead of lowering taxes, you know, especially right now with all the inflation and everything. So that, yep. 
the oh, let's just give it to somebody else that's not working. And all the people that are working and generating <coughs> all these taxes are the one paying the penalty for it. Um, you know, I saw really concerned about that. So I hope you guys address that. Well, thank you for that. And <clears throat> I share your concern, certainly. Mm -hmm. And let's just take, for instance, the, you know, Waltz wants to do the Waltz check thing. Yeah. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. It may, it may be brought up, it may not. But if he goes ahead with that, um, his plan is to just give everybody a check, yeah. right? So if you, whether you paid taxes or not, you're going to get some money. So those of us that paid taxes are not getting, you know, it's not like we're relieving the yeah. people that paid it in. We're actually giving it, giving a check to every person out there. Um, it's, which is more of a stimulus program than it is an actual tax, uh, tax relief program. I'd much rather see us restructure how we collect taxes. The Social Security tax is one example. There's others uh, where we just don't need to be taking as much money out of people's pockets as we have been. Yeah, that's, that's and, huge. And that's like <coughs> social, I, I just hit Social Security, so it's like, mm -hmm. you know, these people that, you know, instead of overtaxing the people that work, well, and then reduce the taxes to get the people that aren't working out there, get them motivated to work. Exactly. And they'll generate more taxes for the state that way. I couldn't agree with you more. And the, social, the tax on Social Security, you know, we're one of a very small number of states that does tax Social Security. So uh, retired people look at that and they think, well, I'm a, maybe I should go to a state where they don't tax my Social Security. Exactly. So it's just one more reason to not stay in Minnesota. And we need people to stay here and be part of our part of our economy. So I think you're right on the money as far as where I stand on that. I would guess Gary's just in a similar position. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, as, as <coughs> people get on Social Security, in many cases, they are fully retired. And when they're fully retired, they don't have that variable income. They're on a flat income. And so as you get older, and in many cases, people start out living their money. And it's not because they didn't save, it wasn't because they weren't frugal, it's they lived longer than what the charts would say you're gonna live. And so that money, they start running out of money, and so anything we can do to put more money in their pocket, and that would be through that social security tax, to me, makes sense. You've already paid tax on it to start with, so why are we double taxing it? And I think it's a piece that can help a lot and it can spread across a lot of people. The, uh, the given a one-time check, yeah, it's probably pretty nice uh, to get that check, but that check is spent real quick. Mm -hmm. I would much rather see tax reform to where you get a tax reduction, be it social security, be it income tax, be it a combination, whatever that might be, but you get it every paycheck, every month, every year, and it's a continuous thing that you get that tax reduction, and it's a long-term thing. And so, yeah, I, I think we need to do that reform, and, and uh, we gotta be cautious how we handle that $17.8 billion. Currently, our budget, like I said, is 50 billion, and there are folks out there that are advocating to spend the whole works. If you do that, you're looking at about 34 to 35% of the current budget. So in one biennium, you would, you would increase the budget by about 35%. Now that money is here to do it for this biennium, but the next biennium, all that additional cost comes back in what we call tails, or you have to, it gets respent again the next biennium and the next biennium because you've got a program that needs to be funded that you started with that money. And so it just keeps growing and growing. And when you would have a, if you grow your, your, your uh, general fund budget by 34 to 35% in any one given biennium, you're gonna really struggle in those out years. I mean, there's gonna be some major problems. And so we got to safeguard so that we don't uh, uh, do something like that to where that money all gets spent and we just end up multiplying our, our budget and just keep multiplying it in the future. So we certainly need to look at tax reform and certainly some of those dollars should go, in my opinion, go to that. You know, there's some other things out there that, that I could certainly support for some of these, for some of this surplus, but
but I'd want to see it done in one-time funding. So you're not starting a new program that you have to keep feeding for the next 20 years. Roads and bridges. We could put some money into roads and bridges and do a one-time fund and make a major impact. There's several other things, you know, in the healthcare system. We could probably do some one-time funding to kind of get through this inflationary cycle and let, you know, get things to settle down a little bit and get through that so things would get somewhat back to normal. There's several ways that we could do that. Also, there's nothing wrong with uh, keeping some of that money on the bottom line. I mean, just because we've got 17.8 million doesn't mean that we have to spend it all. We can certainly put some of that in the bottom line and keep it. Last year, that 13 point some billion ended up being probably a little over 11. That got put on the bottom line. And so we can continue to do that. When you put it in the bottom line, basically what happens is as a government, we borrow money pretty much every month and then it's paid back as, as it comes in. Well, you just borrow that much less and just use the money you got. It doesn't mean it disappeared. It's still earmarked in the surplus account, but you're just using it instead of borrowing some funds and you can pull that out for the next biennium. If you have a deficit, you could pull that money back and put it in that way. So. Other questions? Mayor Watt, it's not so much a question, it's just a warning. Yep. I know. <laughs> Stay away from that stuff. I mean, <clears throat> it's going to be unavoidable, I think, but if you can avoid that, passing that, that's, well, I, that's a nightmare. You go to the other states that have had that, it's just mm -hmm. the hospitalization skyrocket, accidents skyrocket, the crime goes up. Any way you can avoid that, get that message across to Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%, but personally I'm opposed to legalizing marijuana. On the other hand, <clears throat> I think it's coming. Yeah, it, it is uh, coming. <clears throat> and it's, it's such a complicated situation. Number one, it's these substances are prohibited at the federal level, level yeah. but yet they're allowed <laughs> in many states. So you create the situation where some people are, if they use marijuana, they threaten their, their livelihood. If, you get, if you're a truck driver, for instance, uh, if you get caught with marijuana, you're, you're going to lose your CDL. Well, that's, that's the end of your career as a truck driver. Um, and you've got this financial situation where the money that these operations handle can't go into federal banking institutions. So they have to deal in cash or bitcoins or something. Well, that's a whole other level of risk for those people that are dealing with these things. All you have to do is look back to what happened last year when they, um, at the state level, when they legalized these gummies and other products, uh, drinks and everything else that contain THC, but they failed to put in place a regulatory agency that really has direct supervision over that and, and the resources to actually supervise those products. Um, plus, they didn't bother to put any taxation on them, so you're, you're gaining all these problems that you mentioned without taking in the resources it takes to deal with those problems. Uh, we can't afford to do the same thing with, with marijuana. It's, no, yeah, it's, we just, it's, we, can, we need to be much more deliberate and cautious about it. If we're gonna legalize this, what to, what's the structure gonna be and how are we gonna guarantee that we can handle the problems that are a result of the legalization? So I'm, I'm on the same page you're on, I think, in general anyway. Um, and I'm hoping that we're smart enough to do it, do it right. Um, it'd be nice if the federal government would actually create a policy that makes sense for all these states that are, have already legalized these products, but uh, I don't see that changing. So we need to deal with it at the state level and, and we need to do it right. Um, I don't think they'll do that particular maneuver right off the bat uh, this session. The Speaker of the House has already said that they're going to push that off into the next okay. year of the biennium, the second year of the biennium, but that doesn't mean they're not going to do it because I think they are. They had, a, they had a strong effort already going on last year uh, and they've got a structure that they think will work. So we'll be, we'll be monitoring that closely and trying to do everything we can to, to, to rein it in. If it were up to me again, I I would not legalize marijuana. But yeah, it's a rat hole to go down. Mm -hmm. Open it up the other drugs. 
Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's... We get marijuana, we bring all the other stuff in. <coughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and these THC products, many of them are, are <coughs> aimed at young people. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they uh, are. You know, uh, and that's a whole other problem. Yeah. The potency is so much higher than that. It's... The uh, ditch weed out of the 70s. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. And there's also, now there's synthetic THC. Yep. So there's all these different classifications of THC and all these different products, and yet we don't have an agency that's properly structured and funded to regulate them. It's, it was a big mistake in my book. Well, I think... Uh, I do Clay? have a kind of question about this, because the, the edible has come up here locally at City Council. A lot of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe when we're caught off guard by how this got legalized and they have to catch up, you know, figure out laws. But um, the thing I was always curious about is how did this even get passed on the state level? You guys have both said that uh, you kind of opposed this, and uh, Republicans did have the majority in the Senate last. Uh, how did this get sneaked by in the first place that this happened? I'll let Gary finish up because he knows more about it, but basically there was this change at the federal level in the Ag Bill, is my understanding, yes. that actually kind of opened the door for this stuff. Mm -hmm. And and so they what they did last year was just kind of ex recognize that change at the federal level, but what they, in my mind, what they didn't do is then put all these other things in place to to make sure they deal, dealt with it properly. And I'll, I'll, but I'll let Gary... Uh... Yeah, this, was, uh, this came about in, I believe it was the 2018 Federal Ag Bill. They put in some regulations on hemp and on some of these other products. But they did not put it on this particular product, as I understand it. So what happened is that was challenged in court, and I believe it was at the federal level, and the court said that it was uncontrolled, but that it, and it was that you could go ahead and sell it, but that it was just uncontrolled. So the medical and the pharmaceutical industry came to us, came to the legislative body and asked in Minnesota if we could put some parameters on that particular product. And so what happened then is in that bill, it put a tire, it put a tougher parameters on to sell the stuff and some certain things, some guardrails. Well, by doing that, it kind of the mar people realized that that market was an open market, and that's how the thing got going. And uh, I was surprised that that, it, that hadn't been picked up on earlier, but it hadn't been, and so that's a lot of how this came about is the guard, there was guardrails in the bill to uh, make it tougher to, to use and sell that stuff, but it ended up opening, a, creating a market in a sense because it became known that that was a marketable issue. So that's kind of what happened there as I understand it. Um, it and and you, you were talking about marijuana, sir. I, I'm in the same camp, Paul, as I, I do not support legalizing it, but I do believe it will happen. Well, I, in my opinion, we need to make sure that we got all of these, these issues, take us, the issues that it causes solved. In other words, if you get picked up and you're under the influence of marijuana, we need a testing mechanism for that. We have one for alcohol, but we don't have one for marijuana. We need a mechanism to test that. Also, how is it gonna work with the businesses that are testing to make sure their people are drug free Marijuana can stay with them for quite a while. How is that going to work when you legalize it and say that it's okay to use it, but when they go to the business in two weeks, you know, after two weeks of using it or a week they didn't use it for a couple of weeks and they lose their job because of it, how is that all going to be worked out? <coughs> Excuse me. And I think those are very important issues that have to be dealt with and figured out if, if this is going to go forward. Um, People talk a lot about, you know, you're going to bring in all these tax dollars. But in looking at other states, many of the states that are doing this are spending more than the tax dollars they're bringing in. Because I think so many times there's a misconception of what all the social issues will be. You mentioned medical and things like that. Those costs, I think, have been underrated. 
but when reality sets in and they start selling it as a retail product, they find out that these costs are higher than what had been estimated. So uh, I think it'd be pushing the envelope pretty hard to try to get it done this year because I think the public's going to have a lot of questions. Uh, and it does appear there's public support to do it, but I think there's going to be a lot of questions if it's done without solving some of these other issues before it's done. So we'll see how it plays out and see where it goes. You probably need a regulatory agent in the agency in there that yeah. the government would. I mean, quality of the product. Yeah. Uh, licensing, so you're not, you know, everything. In you current. Know, you huge mm, that's a huge. You set that into place. Absolutely. You know, to make sure it's all working. Yeah. And currently, I don't see a good agency probably to try to slide it in with. Uh, I mean, I think, like you're saying or indicating, it probably needs to be its own agency. Um, or if it's not its own agency, if it's a, if it's part of another agency, there has to be a specific division for that, you know, so yes. that like with commerce, you've got the insurance part of it, but there, you know, there's a specific part of commerce that handles the insurance issues. Maybe it'd have to be, you know, if it's under H health and human services, wherever it might be, alcohol, tobacco, wherever it might be, but it has to have a pretty strong, a pretty strong division within that to make sure that it's being done right. Yep. Other questions, concerns? Well, uh, going back to the surplus a bit here, I yeah. know last year we were, last session we were trying to, uh, infrastructure concerns that you're mm -hmm. hoping we could use some of that surplus we had for that. Um, so I'm just kind of curious specifically what, uh, what infrastructure thing, it seems like that probably will be Yeah, so, you know, <coughs> last year, the second year of the past biennium is when we normally would pass a major bonding bill. And I was pretty surprised that that didn't happen, um, given the players that were involved and the fact that there was, uh, you know, we already had a surplus last year, but it didn't. Uh, they didn't reach an agreement. Um, I think there was demands from the Democrats for things that just were unpalatable to Republicans. And you have to remember that a, a, bond, a capital investment bill that, that, that sells bonds has to have a super majority. So it requires votes from the Republican caucus, in this case, along with the Democrats, to get it passed. Um, I would hope that they would pick up that bill from last year, uh, clean it up a little bit so that it's acceptable to some Republicans, and then uh, pass a bonding bill, a, a pretty good-sized bonding bill, the first year of the biennium, and then come back after the committees had had time to tour the state and see what the needs are, and pass a second bill in the second year of the biennium. Would make sense to me whether that's the way it'll happen or not, I have no idea. But as far as the content of that bill, um, the, we need to invest in the sorts of things that actually support and, and, you know, make our economy work better. You mentioned roads and bridges. That certainly is, is a big piece of it. But it's also, especially for our smaller communities, we've seen a lot of the infrastructure get to the point where it's aging out, you know, whether it's your sewer system or your stormwater system, and to a certain extent, the, the roads and streets uh, of our small towns. Stuff is, uh, it's... Much of it's out of sight, out of mind, but it's getting old. Well, we saw it in Minneapolis recently. They had a major 36-inch cast iron water main that's been in place since 1888 ruptured, and it uh, took them days to get it repaired. Um, that same scenario is true in many of our small towns, uh, where this infrastructure that's there has been there for a long time, and it needs to be replaced. And this, typically the state has helped with those sorts of projects, and much of the Resources to do that have come through the Capital Investment Committee, uh, and those resources are administered by PFA, which does a great job of uh, identifying which cities need it uh, and which cities can use it at a certain time. So I, I, it's my hope that that'll happen, uh, that it, and that bill won't get loaded up with too much uh, what I call fluffy stuff. Uh, you know, some particular legislators have a pet project that they think should be funded, whether it's an 
opera house or whatever. Um, there'll be some of that, you can't completely avoid it, but the bill, the, it should stick to the things that actually help our economy move forward. That's my opinion. Uh, so we'll see if that, uh, if that comes forward in that fashion. I think uh, there's a good chance it will. Now, there's been some talk, I don't know how serious it is, about doing a cash bill for capital investment. That would take a part of that surplus and just spend that money on these capital investment type projects. If, it's, if the bill that is, comes before the legislature is only cash, if it doesn't involve any borrowing, then it can be passed with a normal majority doesn't require the supermajority. So the Democrats, in this case, could do that without any Republican votes. They could put together a bill that spends only cash, doesn't do any borrowing, and they could pass that without uh, any support from the Republicans. That, I think, would be a mistake, personally. Um, that's just kind of not the way we've operated in this investment uh, structure in the past. But it, it's, it could happen. Uh, they, may, they may come forward with that. I would support more cash than usual. There's always been some cash in the bonding bill because some projects you just can't fund with borrowed money, uh, but it's been a fairly small percentage. Uh, that percentage could be larger this time because we do have the surplus, but I still think it should be a, a combination of cash and borrowing to invest in these sorts of projects. I think some of the other things that uh, we could be looking at is uh, Broadband in rural Minnesota is certainly a big issue, and there's being a lot being a lot of dollars spent on broadband at this point, but we still got a long ways to go. And so broadband certainly an area that some of these dollars could be spent in. And with our universities and our colleges, we have a lot of buildings that are aging, and those buildings need a lot of attention. And so there's a, a piece of the bonding called the heaper portion of it. And that's money that goes in, comes out of the bonding bill or goes through bonding and goes to the university and then to, to uh, Minnesota colleges for them to upkeep and maintain their buildings. And so we're several billion in a deficit on that category and that account. And so we could be putting some money into that account in order to upgrade some of these buildings that are still going to be needed. Now, I get a little cautious when we talk about building new buildings on campuses because of the fact that the attendance is doing what it's doing, and we're also seeing that uh, offline or online learning is, is something that's growing every year. So it's questionable how many new buildings we need on college campuses, but we certainly need to maintain the ones that we have and keep those up to, uh, keep those up to, keep them up to snuff as such. You know, there are some new buildings going on in some of the college campuses, and usually it's because the building they're using, it can't accommodate the new, a lot of the new cabling and a lot of those new things are just the way they were built, they just don't accommodate. The other thing is, is the classroom structure has changed so much that in many cases, those buildings can't be repurposed to, to meet the current needs. So sometimes you have to take a building down and put up a new one, but Certainly, I'd like to see some money for that go from, from the bonding bill go for the heaper portion of it to keep these campuses so that we don't get into a situation to where we have an awful lot of buildings that need a lot of work and start having some issues there. But we'll see how it all plays out. Uh, but I think bonding with some of this money going in, just like Paul talked about, you know, a combination of cash and rather bonding, I think that's a good idea. Uh, if we were going to use some of the cash for some of these other things, such as roads and bridges, I could support something like that. There's various infrastructure, infrastructure out there, not only in the metro but in the rural area, that could use attention. And if it's done as one-time money, uh, you know, I could warm up to some of those ideas. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'd just add that uh, one of the qualifications for a bonding project is it has to have regional significance. Mm -hmm. And there is a project here in New Ulm that I believe has regional significance. It's a statue that's up on the hill out here. Um, I, that, <coughs> as I think uh, the community knows, that is going to need a significant upgrade to uh, the, the statue itself was, Herman was taken down a few years ago and repaired, but the, the base that he stands on is, is getting pretty old and needs mm -hmm. to be refurbished. 
So that project is one I'm very interested in. It's not quite ready at this point for a bill because it takes a lot of preparation to get it in, in to the point where we can actually present it to the legislature. Um, I'm sure there will be a, a local effort to raise funds to, to pair with state money in order to get that done, and that's the way it should be. Uh, a, a strong, a strong contribution from the local community or from the from the regional community to, to help with that project. But uh, perhaps I don't know how quickly they're going to get it together. But as soon as that's ready for prime time, so to speak, I'll be happy to carry a bill uh, to uh, try and get that into the into the next bonding bill that uh, that would qualify for. Other questions. Well, I don't think there's really any doubt that we're going to see an increase in education funding. Uh, that's something that the governor has been very adamant about and, and his party in general has been supportive of. Um, but I, it's my hope that along with the dollars, we also make sure that the dollars are going to good use and that we're plugging the holes that need to be plugged, so to speak, when it comes to education. Uh, we've seen here in New Alm and other communities uh, of, of fairly substantial investment in hands-on type of uh, education through these tech centers that have have been uh, sprouting up. I hope that uh, we would continue to, to support that. Um, there's a lot of good jobs out there for people that uh, are willing, that are qualified for hands-on work. I'm thinking of, you know, plumbers and electricians and mechanics, and, and there's a real need. And, and high schools that uh, can can put those sorts of programs in place can really, you know, get these kids back in, into the workforce much more quickly. So uh, those sorts of things I would certainly support um, and try to stay away from some of the things that uh, aren't quite as beneficial to the economy. I think in many cases uh, the best way, best way for us to do funding to schools is to put that funding in the basic formula. That way somebody in New Ulm, the student in New Ulm gets the same dollars to the school as a student in New Hope or a student in the inner city or whatever, whatever. But that makes a lot of difference because the balance between what we get per student in rural Minnesota, what the seven county metro area gets and what the inner city or St. Paul, Minneapolis get is drastically different. So if we put that money into the base formula, our schools out here, get more money than they would doing it the other way. The other thing is, is that the other, another reason I like to put it there is because it gives our local school board, our local administrators, and our local teachers the decision to decide where that money could be best spent for them to get their kids the best education. And that's what this is all about, is getting our kids the best education. And I think that having the, superintendent, having the administration, superintendent principals, your school board, your teachers, I think those folks sitting down and saying, how can we get our best kids education with the dollars we're getting, makes a lot more sense than me sitting in St. Paul saying, I think they should put it here and put it here and put it here. What I'm really saying when I do that is this is a cookie cutter approach and everybody should do the same. And it doesn't work that way. In, in every school does things different and let's let them do that as long as they're getting some performance and as long as these students are getting the education they need I would much rather see those decisions made locally because I think they'll get more out of the dollar than they will by us in St. Paul telling them how to spend the money. So, One of the things we haven't talked about too much to this point at this meeting is inflation. Uh, <clears throat> inflation is going to take a bite out of pretty much everything um, and increase the costs of everything that uh, the state of Minnesota is involved with. So whether it's a building project. I know uh, in one of our school districts here in the district, they passed a bond issue, um, but between when the bond issue passed and when they actually started uh, looking at how much it was going to cost, uh, the costs had gone up by 20, 30 percent. Um, so that's going to be the same case for the 
what the projects we talked about already, the roads and bridges and infrastructure, it's all going to cost more. And we've seen, uh, you know, labor costs are going up too. If you've watched what the union demands and results have been recently, uh, the cost of people are taking home uh, bigger paychecks, but that money's got to come from somewhere. So a good percentage of this surplus we have is actually going to get eaten up by inflation, I think. Um, that's something we have to have to recognize and deal with. Other questions? Yes, sir. Anything else? I can't make anything okay. right now. Well, the only other thing I, would, I know another big thing coming up is just our, you know, our nursing homes and other care facilities like that. They're still having mm -hmm. similar struggles. I know our Oak Hills here wants to expand and other things, but they're yeah. funny. Yeah. Oh, there was a uh, hope for well, there was a piece in the paper just recently that described the situation very well. Candace did a really nice job of laying that out for the public, um, and it's a it's a huge problem um, finding people that are capable and willing to work in these facilities is very challenging, especially given the fact that the wages they can offer are held down by the way the way the reimbursements are structured, especially in the nursing home, because there's this equalization where private pay can't pay any more than, they can't charge a private pay person any more than what they get from from the uh, federal or state, uh, state rates. Uh, I think it's a very critical issue. Uh, we've seen some nursing homes already have closed uh, uh, in the area, and there are more that are on the brink, and places like Oak Hills here in New Ulm have actually not been able to fill all their beds because they don't have enough help. On the other hand, if, if we're going to make changes there, we have to make sure that we kind of keep it even between the nursing homes and the group homes that hire a similar workforce. If we let one get a lot better uh, wage offer than the other, then it's, the employees start going from one to the other, and that's, that's not helpful because there's a crisis in, in, in kind of in that industry in general. And so if we're going to raise uh, these rates, reimbursement rates, we need to raise them kind of raise, raise them all in a somewhat equal fashion so that we don't create another problem by, uh, by uh, doing too well for one and not well enough for another. So I think what happens is it uh, wasn't that many years ago we did some equalization and raised some of these rates and stuff, but it's an ongoing it's it's just it's ongoing in the nursing home industry and in the industry with the disabled and stuff. It's kind of an ongoing thing, so I think we have to do more than just try to uh, patch it up with a bandage. It's it's we need to take a a real close look and see exactly what we need to do to make uh, these nursing homes so that they can function and and have the care that they need for their for their patients, but also be able to take care of the employees there that are working there, you know, those are tough jobs. Uh, those are really tough jobs for these people. And so you've got to like to work with people in order to take one of these jobs. And so we certainly don't want to be penalizing them in pay because of the fact that they're in one of these positions. So something's going to have to be done, some dollars put into this system. But I don't think with the nursing home situation and the, the, the group homes and stuff, it's going to take more than one-time money. It's going to have to be a, de you know, we're going to have to look at some dollars that are going to be there for more than just, uh, you know, one or two years because this is a cycle that's going to take a, quite a while to get straightened out and worked out. So, But it is something we're going to have to take a look at. We did have some pretty serious discussions about it last year. Uh, we had a, quite a bit more money put in on the Senate side than what the governor had put in in his proposals and what the DFL House had put in in their proposals. But uh, that was one of, the, one of the issues at the end that we couldn't get together on was the number of dollars that were going to be spent. But uh, it is something that's going to be a continuing discussion, and hopefully we uh, uh, get something done with that this year to move that ball forward. Because so, it is an issue, and we have a lot of people retiring going into the homes, and as those people retire, it takes less people out of the work, it takes more people out of the workforce, but then in many cases, we're putting, a lot of these people are going into the nursing home because of the needs, 
And so we're getting kind of in a catch-22. We're loading, we're taking them out of one end and loading it up on the other end, and in the middle there, it makes it's it's getting to be pretty tough. So we do have to do something with it. Absolutely. Yep. Yes, sir. On the uh, opposite end of the age spectrum, there, do you guys see any like bipartisan way forward for the child care crisis in the state? I hope so. Um, it's certainly a very hot topic, and. Uh, we're seeing it have a serious impact, especially on smaller communities where if they can't offer, if there's not childcare available, they can't attract young people to come to their communities. Uh, we've seen some communities go to a, like a nonprofit model where it's a community run uh, childcare system and that's certainly an option that, that should be considered and we should support. A lot, part of the problem is a result of over-regulation in my opinion, where for some of these in-home uh, child care providers have just kind of thrown up their hands because the regulations have gotten so difficult to deal with that they're just saying oh, we're just it's too much it's too much regulation for me to make it worth my while so a combination of things needs to be taken taken a look at and I hope that we can address this child care crisis because it also results it has so many ramifications down the road with our especially in small communities well all communities really um, because if people can't get child care, then they can't work. Um, and that's, that's a real problem. It's a real problem for employers who, who uh, depend on, uh, are having trouble finding enough employees the way it is. It's, it's kind of interesting because what happens is people see what wages they can earn, and if they can't find child care, in many cases, one of the spouses will stay home and take care of the children. So if we can alleviate some of these child care problems and get these children in the child care, we can get, the, uh, get the, these both spouses probably to be in the, in the industry and in the working field. But we have so many problems with the regulations. Uh, back four or five, might even be longer than that, when they tried to unionize daycare and it didn't work, they came back then and just started regulating the heck out of that industry. And that industry is so overregulated, and we have to understand that when we have children in daycare, they have to be properly cared for, they have to be taken care of, absolutely. But I think we've just kind of went off the deep end on that. And so it's really hard to get somebody that, to go into daycare and say, take care of five, six, seven, eight children. It's really hard to get people to do that because of all the regulations and, and there's just, you just don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring. And so I think that we have to take a real strong look at the regulations. We have to make sure the kids are safe, understand that, we have to do that. But we don't have to go overboard on it. We have to encourage, some communities have, have community daycare programs work out very, very well. Some communities can't afford that. So we need to figure out a way to get some of these, these individuals back into that marketplace. It wasn't that many years ago and there was a lot of different individual opportunities within many communities, and that has really shrunk down, and so that puts the pressure on. And so if we're gonna, it's kind of, a lot of these pieces of this puzzle kind of go into line. I mean, if we can provide daycare, that helps people get, they'll be in the workforce. If you have people in the workforce, it helps the businesses that are looking for them. Also, the other piece of that is housing. We have to make sure that we have, our communities have housing that's suitable uh, at, the, at the right rent levels and stuff like that. And those are things that uh, we need to work on. I think one of the things we need to do is we need to get our agencies that deal with daycare and deal with housing. All of these agencies have to work together instead of each going their own direction. One's passing, doing uh, regulations through rule and regulations through their, to their ability to do that. Another one's doing that and many a times they don't communicate and so they don't know that they're really counteracting each other. But uh, I think we have to have more cooperation, work together more. We certainly have to do something in both those areas. Well, we're kind of getting close to the end of our time here. One topic that I think we should talk a little bit about is, is how we are operating at the Capitol. Um, over COVID time, of course, every, almost everything was on Zoom. Um, and it's our hope and our understanding that uh, we're gonna be live. And I'm hoping that we're live for everything, that uh, 
if you're going to, as a member of the legislature, if you're going to vote on a bill in committee, that you need to be in the committee room and doing that work live and in person. And the same on the House floor, if you're going to vote on bills uh, for the state of Minnesota, you should be in your seat on the House floor casting your ballot. That's the way it used to be before COVID, and I hope that's the way it is in the future because it has a real impact on how we function. If you can't, if, if your colleagues aren't with you in St. Paul, how do you negotiate, uh, how do you negotiate with them and have an effective way of bringing ideas forward? You know, what happens before meetings in the hallway and after meetings is, is an important part of what, how things get done in St. Paul. So I, I'm strongly in favor of legislators being in St. Paul, doing their work and casting their ballots from the committee room and from the House and Senate floors. At the same time, I, Zoom is, is great technology and those that want to testify to our committees, if they want to be able to testify electronically via Zoom or Teams or whatever, that does make sense. So if you're, if you're from Thief River Falls and you want to testify on a bill that's before a committee in the Minnesota House of Representatives, allowing those testifiers to testify uh, by Zoom, that's fine. Um, then they don't have to drive all those miles and spend all that time and they can get their two cents in uh, into the committee uh, um, and we can sit there and watch and ask questions and that, that, that part makes sense to me and that's one way where technology can actually make uh, people's access to government more effective and that's, that's fine. But as far as our, us as legislators, we need to, have, we need to be in the in the seat, uh, in the debate, uh, casting our ballots live. And so that's what I'm hoping will happen. It's not clear yet exactly what's going to happen. There's, there's some, some folks within this legislature that think that we should still have the option to uh, attend virtually, uh, attend committee meetings virtually or attend House uh, and Senate uh, floor action virtually. I, I hope we don't, but it's not up to me alone. Well, we're at that time. Uh, I certainly want to thank you folks for coming and thank the folks for doing the broadcasting and from the media, certainly thank you for this and thank you for allowing us to use this facility. Uh, session will start January 3rd and we'll go till the, through the third Tuesday of May. And so what Paul and I typically do is we come out before the session starts and then at the end of the session, after it's ended, we come out and talk about what was done during the session and ask, question, ask your questions and stuff based on, on, on that. We've been asked a lot of times why we don't do this over Easter break. And one of the reasons we don't, I guess the biggest reason we don't, is that when bills come through, usually by the time we take our Easter break, it's too late to submit a bill. It's too late to make changes to that bill. So if we do it on Easter break, we can hear what you have to say, but it, we can't do much to change it. Where if we do them early like this, we understand what different, you know, what different people think and what they want as far as communities and this and that. And that helps us look at what our process will be. And then at the end, we can kind of let you know what happened. So that's just kind of a summary of that. But certainly appreciate uh, the opportunity to represent uh, this community at the Senate. And uh, if you need to get a hold of us, feel free to do so. Just uh, go on the website uh, and look up our phone number, look up our email address, and, and let us know, uh, uh, get a hold of us. And if you're going to be at the Capitol at all, let us know. We'd we'll certainly like to set up a meeting with you. And uh, Paul and I both have newsletters. So if you want to get on our newsletter, just uh, call our office and just leave a message. Give them your email address, because we'll, our, our, their email will get you on our newsletter. And during session, we do them once a week. After session, we usually do them once a month. But uh, our newsletter kind of updates what's going on each week in the legislative body, in the Senate, and kind of what bills we're talking about and some of the different things like that. And so it's kind of a way to keep up with what's going on. But if you have any particular questions, certainly feel free to call us. Uh, uh, send us an email or text us, whatever. So with that said, thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Paul for closing comments. Well, uh, likewise, thank you. We have a small but high-quality crowd here this morning. Yes. And uh, 
Appreciate those of you that could come and appreciate those that are listening uh, later on cable. As Gary said, uh, please reach out to us with your concerns. There's a variety of ways to get a hold of us, whether it's by email or telephone. Um, we, uh, we will be as responsive as we can be. And with the Capitol being open, uh, back open again, uh, I'm sure we're going to see a lot more folks coming to St. Paul uh, for their days on the hill or just to visit the Capitol. So, and you're always welcome. Um, and uh, sorry about the weather today. Couldn't do much about that. So, but uh, look forward to uh, looking forward to an active uh, session, uh, one that will certainly be very interesting as we deal with the surplus and try to put together our next budget. Um, and deal with uh, some really important policy issues for the state of Minnesota. So thanks again, and uh, see you soon. And certainly want to thank the library for allowing us to, for hosting us. We really do appreciate it. This works out very well. So thank you, folks, and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. You too. Likewise.